Let us prepare our hearts. The Lord be with you. <clears throat> Almighty God, you look with loving mercy on your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, to be given over to the hands of sinners, and to suffer death on the cross, who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kindred Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Judas, then, when Judas said to them, when Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. 
So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that had been spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave, the slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple, where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, Are you not also one of his disciples? Are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed.
Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the poli police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law. And according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you, do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you 
is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sits himself, sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him with, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross, it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill the scripture, to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken 
and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this was, has testified so that you also may believe his testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission. So he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and alloys weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in, in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified. And in the garden, there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. The Passion of our Lord. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We read the Passion of Christ. And one of the things that the Passion of Christ and this day called Good Friday should remind us of is that, yes, we might be resurrection people, but we are also people of the cross. The resurrection means much less if we don't have the cross. We're people of the cross. Martin Luther said our theology is a theology of the cross. And I'm going to try to explain that today. We'll see if I succeed. Sometimes we trivialize the cross. Uh, churches are removing crosses from their sanctuary because they think they're too negative. That should never be. In fact, to show you how our society thinks of the cross, Walker Bailey, a pastor of a large United Methodist Church in Dallas, Texas, 
His church was on the corner, and right across the street was an art museum. Every Lent, Pastor Bailey's church put up this huge cross right on the corner, right on the intersection in front of the church. And it was a large cross, rough hewn, and it was meant to look as much like the cross that maybe Jesus hanged on as could be. Well, one year, Pastor Bailey got a call during Lent from a woman who represented the art museum. And she asked Pastor Bailey, these are, were her words, for God's sake, Reverend, can't you do something with that dreadful cross out in front of your church? She wanted the cross down because she thought it ruined the good looks of the neighborhood, I guess. And Pastor Bailey didn't tell her that a couple of years earlier, the museum put in a huge temporary uh, display of a work right across the street from the church of a work called The Gates of Hell. That was all right, evidently, but a cross was not. So the woman didn't want to debate. She just wanted the cross down. Of course, Pastor Bailey said, it will not come down until well after Easter. The cross will remain. So that's sometimes the way our society thinks. The cross is merely <clears throat> something negative. Let's move on to the resurrection. Let's be resurrection people, not cross people. But here's why the cross is so important. It has um, been important in people's lives. Of course, the Apostle Paul, even in his day, said the cross is foolishness to the Gentiles, but it's wisdom to those who are wise. Daniel Orlander, in his little book, Baptized We Live. Don't know if, if I can call this a book as much as a pamphlet, but it tries to explain how Lutherans understand the Christian faith. And he says this about the cross. This symbol is central because it is here on the cross that God meets us, where God makes himself present to us. Hidden in weakness, vulnerable, suffering, forsaken, dying. I don't know about you, and I'm sure we all have had our share of tragedy and agony in our lives. And what Daniel Erlander is trying to remind us that God on the cross meets us in our own personal ag agony, in our own personal trials. That's where God is real. He continues, in the abyss of despair, in the deepest darkness, God comes. In the painful reality of our mortality, our ultimate loneliness, our weakness, God encounters us. As we view the cross, all of our human attempts to find God are exposed as illusions. We do not find God by proving his existence by the wonder of nature or the power of logic. We do not find God by value, 
validating his presence by visible blessings. We do not find God by having a prescribed religious experience. We do not find God by earning divine love by our good works. We do not find God by building glorious religious institutions. We do not find God by reaching a high level of personal morality. We do not find God by saving ourselves through status, wealth, knowledge, consumption, chemicals, positive thinking, correct religious doctrine, self-help groups. We do not find God. God finds us. And then he says, the cross is God's embrace. God enters our darkness and embraces us with total and unconditional acceptance, identifying completely with the pain and sorrow of our existence. God woos us into a love relationship with himself. And then, the cross is God's victory. God enters our darkness and exposes and defeats the powers that reign in this world. By the death of Jesus, God liberates us from any person, thing, system, or ism which would enslave us by demanding loyalty. We are free, free to let God be God, and free to let ourselves be human. Let me give you an example. This is the um, story of Ed Dobson. He was the pastor of a megachurch, 5,000 members. I guess that still qualifies as a megachurch. He, um, he, he was very popular as a pastor. His sermons were broadcast in quite a large region of that area. He was a popular writer, author, and often gave lectures and presentations all over. And then, oh, he led 20 trips to Israel. He was an avid hiker, runner, golfer, soccer player, until he found out he was dying. He had ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. Over time, and of course, it destroys your muscles, it destroys the nerves uh, surrounding your muscles, so your muscles become extremely weak and eventually kills you. And he said this happened when he was 50. And the doctors gave him another two to five years. And this is what he said. I felt I was sinking into the darkness. I felt like my life was over. I felt like I had been buried alive. And what he learned from that was that when he was the pastor of this 5,000 member megachurch, it was the happy church. It was the resurrection church. But when he was dying, he found the cross of Christ, the suffering of Christ, meeting him in his suffering was the most powerful experience he had ever had with God. So before we get to the resurrection, find hope today in, fa in the fact that God comes to us weak and dying on a cross. And then know that when you are weak, vulnerable, in despair, 
God will meet you there. Amen. Our service continues with the bidding prayer. Let us pray, brothers and sisters, for the Holy Church of God throughout the world, that God the Almighty, the Almighty Father, guide it and gather it together so that we may worship him in peace and tranquility. Almighty and eternal God, you have shown your glory to all nations in Jesus Christ. Guide the church and gather it through the world. Help it, help, help it to preserve, persevere in faith. Proclaim your name and bring the good news of salvation in Christ to all people. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Let us pray for all our brothers and sisters who share our faith in Jesus Christ that God may gather and keep together in one church all those who know Christ as Lord. Almighty and eternal God, you give your church its unity. Look with favor on all who follow Jesus, your Son. We are all consecrated to you by our baptism. Make us one in the fullness of faith and keep us one in the fellowship of love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Let us pray for those who do not believe in Christ that the light of the Holy Spirit may show them the way of salvation. Almighty and eternal God, enable those who do not acknowledge Christ to receive the truth of the gospel. Help us, your people, to grow in love for one another, to grasp more fully the mystery of your Godhead, and so to become more perfect witnesses of your love in the sight of all people. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Let us pray for those who do not believe in God, that they may find him who is the author and goal of our existence. Almighty and eternal God, you created humanity so that all might long to know you and have peace in you. Grant that, in spite of the hurtful things that stand in their way, they may all recognize in the lives of Christians the tokens of your love and mercy and gladly acknowledge you as the one true God and Father of us all. We ask this, we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for God's creation. Almighty and eternal God, you are the creator of a magnificent universe. 
Hold all the worlds in the arms of your care and bring all things to fulfillment in you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Let us pray for those who serve in public office that God may guide their minds and hearts so that all of us may live in true peace and freedom. Almighty and eternal God, you are the champion of the poor and oppressed. In your goodness, give wisdom to those in authority so that all people may enjoy justice, peace, freedom, and share in the goodness of your creation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Let us pray that God, the almighty and merciful Father, may heal the sick comfort the dying, give safety to travelers, free those unjustly deprived of liberty, and rid the world of falsehood, hunger, and disease. Almighty and eternal God, you give strength to the weary and new courage to those who have lost heart. Hear the prayers of all who call on you in any trouble, that they may have the joy of receiving your help in their need. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Please rise. Finally, let us pray for all those things for which our Lord would have us ask. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Behold the life-giving cross on which was hung the Savior of the whole world. Behold the life-giving cross on which was hung the Savior of the whole world. Behold the life-giving cross on which was hung the Savior of the whole world. 